Gates was now one of the richest and most influential men on earth, and he knew it. One night at a dinner party, he and some friends were discussing the election of Bill Clinton as president, and Gates blurted out, I have as much power as the president does. His wife kicked him under the table when she heard that. But the truth of it was, he might have been right. To many, Gates's power was seductive, irresistible. If you were a young, hungry software engineer like Thomas Reardon or Hadi Partovi or a seasoned executive like Sam Jadala, Microsoft was the place to be. A place where it didn't matter if you were handsome or athletic. A place where smartness, measured by the ability to crank out killer code, was the only thing that counted. In other words, nerd nirvana. In the early 90s, Microsoft campus was a very dynamic culture. You'd, you'd have many of the smartest people in computer science at, at all different ages, but it was a surprisingly young company overall. The average age of the company was probably 26, 27. Microsoft was not the biggest software company in the world, but in a weird way, it was the hottest, and it was clear. It was, it just, there was a vibe when you walked in the door, a kind of, a kind of cockiness that perfused like every kind of job at Microsoft. It wasn't just the engineers. I joined Microsoft in 1987, and uh, this was a group of people who wanted to win. Uh, this was a group of people who, who were very aggressive about uh, uh, the competition. Microsoft's behavior was certainly extreme, but it was driven less by arrogance than by fear and insecurity. Gates knew that at any moment, some puny little startup in a garage somewhere could rise up and topple Microsoft, just as they'd done to others. And along with his trusted lieutenant, Steve Ballmer, he was determined not to let that happen. Unlike Gates, the college dropout, Ballmer had actually been to business school. Where Gates was Microsoft's super ego, skinny and cerebral, Ballmer was its raging id, beefy and emotional. But it was nothing compared to Gates himself, the smartest of the Microsoft smart guys, a brainiac who never suffered fools gladly, if he even suffered them at all. That's ridiculous. I'm not, I'm not doing this thing. No, 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 no. Somebody's confused. Somebody's just not thinking. I mean, there's no way. You guys never understood. You never understood the first thing about this. In all the times that I've met Gates, there's only been one consistent element. The moment when he looked at me and said that something I'd said was the stupidest thing he'd ever heard. And I didn't even work for the guy. But Thomas Reardon did. And he remembers his first meeting with Gates as one of the most unnerving experiences of his life. He is not one known to throw out compliments. It was just sort of a... Looks good. Looks good. Yeah, we'll probably need to do more of this. And that was about the, about the feedback that I felt like we got. And it wasn't that he was disinterested. But I think I learned at the time, really, you feel like you've had a major victory if you haven't been shredded. If he hasn't called you an idiot 19 times, eh, guess what? You had a good bill meeting. With Microsoft's minions under his spell, billions of dollars in his bank account, and the launch of Windows 95 looming on the horizon, the Bill Gates of 1993 was on the verge of becoming the world's high-tech emperor. Less than two years later, though, Gates would be forced to make one of the sharpest U-turns in corporate history because Clark and Dreesen and their team were about to enter the picture and throw a giant roadblock in their path. Parts of the world have always been magnets for certain types of people. LA is for actors, Las Vegas is for gamblers, Paris is for artists. This 30 mile stretch between San Francisco and San Jose has always been a magnet for, shall we say, the technologically inclined. In the summer of 1994, this place had become home base for Jim Clark and his renegade band of young web browser pioneers. In the next few months, they would launch the fastest growing software company the world had ever seen, Netscape Communications. Under the watchful eye of Clark, the Netscape guys were adherents to the cause of spreading the reach of the still embryonic web, and hopefully getting rich in the process. But first, they had to deal with a severe case of culture shock. I've never been out to California before, and when I got here, I'm like, how come no one told me about this place before? <laughs> this is the Mecca. 
Yeah, this is kind of the Disneyland for geeks out here. It was also a brilliant move to take a, a, a bunch of guys, move them out of their home environments and just drop them into a new company because we didn't know anything else except work. The plan was simple. Back in Illinois, the gang had created the first graphical web browser, Mosaic. Now they would work like maniacs to build a new browser based on that and turn the internet into the future of commerce and communication. Just another day at the office, right? I think the mission as communicated to me and the rest of the group was to take over the world as quickly as possible. You know, nothing big, nothing really grand, just go out there and make software so compelling and so great that you'd have to be an idiot not to want it. But everyone at Netscape knew that time was of the essence. The web was becoming more popular with every passing day. The fear was that another, more powerful company would see its potential and launch a browser before Netscape had a chance to. Well, I was on about a 36-hour cycle, so I'd work for about 24 hours and sleep for about 12 hours, fueled in those days primarily by Skittles and Mountain Dew. There was an extreme sense of urgency when, once we started, because we all knew that this wasn't a hard thing to do. And they were right to be worried. Because back in Seattle, even though Bill Gates still had his doubts about the web, some Microsofties were aware of Netscape. Thomas Reardon at one point contacted the young company to sniff around for information and found that whatever their inner fears, Netscape gave off a different public vibe, one of supreme arrogance. We were kind of aware of them at a distance, so called up and talked to a, an executive there and basically got told to go pound sand. And I was like, wow, like every company I called was like, wow, Microsoft's calling. Netscape, 15 minutes and just told me to not interested. And not just, not just not interested, but don't even try calling back. When you're at Microsoft, you kind of get used to being kind of lords of the industry and everybody paying you some you know, homage at some point in time. Nothing. Uh, it's clear that Netscape culturally already perceived Microsoft as the people to take out. On the 13th of October, 1994, after months of feverish non-stop coding, Netscape's new web browser, Navigator, finally hit the streets. From this moment, conflict was inevitable, with Netscape cast as the upstart David and Microsoft as the mighty Goliath. Now, you might not think that David would have much of a chance in this fight, but from the moment Netscape's browser, Navigator, was launched, it was an instant runaway success. The night of the first release, we set up in one of the conference rooms, we set up a, a computer to watch the downloads, and we had a sound effect where there'd be a cannon shot uh, every time somebody downloaded the software. And, you know, after a while, it sounded like a war, because there was just cannon shot, you know, it was just continuous cannon shots. Soon the web was spreading like wildfire around the globe. The Internet age had truly begun, and it had nothing to do with Microsoft. We'd never seen anything like this in the history of software. In 30 days, 90% of the people who were on the web switched from Mosaic to Netscape. That just doesn't happen in software. Nothing. Ever. Ever. There was a point probably when Netscape got a million downloads. And suddenly we thought, what's going on? A million downloads? That's a pretty big number. But the truth is the Microsoft's worries about Netscape ran a lot deeper than its little browser. And to understand why requires just a little technical understanding. In the computer business, the companies that have the most power control what's known as a software platform. That's the software on which other programs run on top. With its near monopoly over the Windows operating system, Microsoft controlled the ultimate platform. It was the one on which the whole computer business rose and fell. And for years, it was impossible to imagine that anyone could ever challenge its supremacy. But now Bill Gates' many rivals in Silicon Valley began to imagine a different future. A future where the browser could be an alternative platform, one where you could carry out all your computing needs online, thereby leveling the playing field in the industry and rendering Windows, the most profitable software in the history of man, completely irrelevant. Suddenly we realized, wow, we've got a kink in the armor. There is, there is a way that somebody could dislodge the Windows franchise. Um, and there are scenarios that uh, could become popular where suddenly we'd lose our leadership position. Netscape's sudden success was impossible for Microsoft to ignore. Suddenly, Bill Gates got it. Not just the importance of the web, but the scale of his own strategic blunder and the need to rectify it right now. Late one night, Gates sat at his computer and pounded out a memo to his troops entitled, The Internet Tidal Wave. 
He declared that the web was, quote, the single most important development in computing since the PC. And he wrote about Netscape as, quote, a new competitor born on the Internet, a competitor that Microsoft absolutely had to, quote, match and beat, which meant...